Okay, so for the, the next uh, session that we're going to have today, we're going to take a little bit more of an international look at healthcare. And uh, I'm sure most of you in the room who've been following this debate for, for many years now will know that whenever anyone talks about healthcare reform, someone inevitably says, well, you're just trying to Americanize the system. You're trying to privatize everything and so forth. I mean, we've all heard this rhetoric for years and years and years now. But uh, certainly, I'm sure everyone in the room has at least seen a world map at some point, or maybe you've spun a globe around on your finger or something and you know that there's 200 other countries out there and the reality is is that there's many other developed nations that have universal health care systems and they're performing much better than Canada's so we thought it would be an, an interesting idea to have a couple uh, experts from some of these international uh, countries with better performing universal systems and have them uh, come and speak and tell us about their systems uh, how they work how they operate but also some of the lessons that they think that our systems could learn. So I'll invite uh, uh, Gustav and Terry up to the stage if you'd like to come up. Um, our first speaker comes all the way from Sweden. Uh, his name is Gustav Droge, and he is the CEO of Synapse, a Swedish think tank that is comprised of doctors and nurses, and they're dedicated to advancing patient rights in healthcare. And uh, my colleague Troy and I, we actually went to Sweden last year, and uh, we were able to speak with a number of different experts there in Sweden and uh, Gustav certainly knew a lot of them. He helped connect us with them and so forth. And they all spoke so highly of him. So no pressure here, Gustav, but uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll do a great job at uh, telling us all about the Swedish system and what we can learn from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Colin. Thank you, Troy. And thank you for the invitation for me to come here. Uh, and uh, I'm especially honored since I actually grew up in uh, Toronto when I and moved back to Sweden when I was uh, seven or eight. So for me, it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a second home because I haven't been back so many times as I would like to. But it's it's really good being in Canada. Um, so my name is Gustav, and I've worked in healthcare for about 20 years, but never as a as a in a medical side, but in the political uh, side. And right now, I have a think tank together with healthcare pro professionals and policy design professionals that we're trying to develop the the Swedish healthcare system which is a product of 70 years of social democratic rule in Sweden. And I guess I, the, the social democrat perspective is quite similar to the, to the same debate that you have in Canada. And as a result of that and some kind of liberalization and market economy, we have created a system that that comes from the same kind of problems that you have in Canada, but we have solved a little bit of it, not all of it, but a little bit, together with uh, private companies and entrepreneurship. And I will, I'll talk to you briefly about that and come back to some lessons. Let's see if this works. Should I press it? There. So, perfect. So a brief intro of the Swedish healthcare model. It's a um, universal healthcare single payer model with promises, we call it regions, with their own taxation. And they're responsible for giving their region healthcare. They're able to provide it through their own uh, companies or healthcare providers, or they can use private healthcare providers to do it. We have uh, 91 percent um, of the population can see a primary, uh, like a GP or equivalent, within three days. This is something that has sprung up after the some kind of um, after the pandemic. We saw an increase of the I don't want you to call it in the Canada, but when meeting your doctor on the phone, that kind of um, uh, interaction really spiked the this kind of. Um, uh, access, so you need to to take that into account. That we we, we uh, include that in this this kind of statistics. We have a high high quality in international comparisons of OECD and and whatnot. But we have a significantly cost increase in especially the publicly run healthcare sector. I know that is quite the same here. If we just match up our spend with your spend. We're spending approximately the same. 
we can, you can calculate it differently, but it's approximately the same. But the results are quite different. And we have, um, when looking to how we're using the private private providers. And when I say private, it is not private in the sense that we have um, insurance companies. We have some of them, but it's a very, very small part of the market. When I say private, it's publicly funded, privately run. So they are substantially lower in cost than the publicly run uh, companies, uh, healthcare providers. And I'll come back to why. But and especially when you see hip surgery, uh, cataracts, uh, you can see um, different kind of surgery that is very conclusive, like either you have it or you don't have it. It doesn't really work. It's not as efficient if, you, if it's talk like psychology, you need to meet with a therapist several times. And the only one who can decide if you need more hours is the therapist. And if you have an incentive model that drives activity, that is not always the best model, but in, it, it's hard to have three hips, so to speak. <laughs> there is a public opinion debate in Sweden that is, I, I was like uh, taking notes when, when the previous speaker was uh, talking about the, 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 the support for privatization and when putting it in the same way that you're doing, we would get the exact same results in Sweden. If you would put it in a, another perspective as, are we able to turn down any help given to solve the healthcare crisis in Sweden? We would get the same results that you would get in Canada. Of course, ev we need everybody. And if putting it in that perspective, we have changed the part of the narrative to be able to include companies and entrepreneurship in cutting costs and making it more attractive as a workplace because we have a have um, our publicly run healthcare providers have a very troubling attracting healthcare profession, professions and making them stay for a longer time. Um, I'll take one example. Um, to change, uh, to get a new hip in Sweden, you get approximately 8,000 Canadian dollars. That is what we pay you to, to meet the patient, make sure the patient is, is safe, we change the hip. But also, if you need corrective surgery, which is not uncommon in hip surgery, uh, previously, that was not included. So then we paid 8,000 for the first surgery and 9,500 for the corrective surgery. And we have a very, too many corrective surger, uh, surgeries. And like, why is this happening? You know, the market works even when it doesn't work. So we, we said, let's, let's fix this with like, we call it a bundle payment. I don't know if you understand, but we, it more like a warranty. Like if you change the hip, then you're responsible because if, if you need corrective surgery, you don't get a, a dime more. And then what happened was they put the best surgeon in the first uh, meeting with the patient, and we got a, a spike in quality. The costs dramatically changed downwards, and the patients were, uh, didn't have, need to have so many uh, corrective uh, surgeries done. And it was actually so, um, it just showed such in, uh, interesting results as, so the Harvard, we're not visited by Harvard so many times in Sweden, but actually they came and made a study about this, and I can um, make sure that you get the link to this. If you're interested in this uh, example, I, I make sure that you can get the information about that. This is uh, an example of um, a privately run, publicly financed hospital. If you're not aware of it, as many journalists are in Sweden, they don't know it's privately run. There is no big signs. Well, there's signs of the company, but nobody really thinks about, when, thinks, about, thinks about that when they're coming in an ambulance or walking in there. It says, uh, it, it, it just says a company name, a French company, uh, French-owned Capio company. Um, but what, what we see when buying healthcare as a, uh, as a single payer in Stockholm region, is that they outperform their twin, another company just close by. And I, can, I can't recommend enough the documentaries made by Colin and uh, also Aaron Gunn. I don't know if he's here, but he made a documentary about this as well. Comparing two hospitals with the exact same uh, mission, 
the, whole, the same population base having completely different results. And the only difference is how it's run. One of, the comp one of the hospitals own their own results. Like if you work weekends, I'll give you extra pay. Or if you don't work weekends, that's okay. There will always be more patients to come. And if we don't meet our budget, there will be more money. So the market works in hospitals as well. You just know, need to know what to buy and what to demand. Uh, so this is just the difference. The, the low one is the, the privately run, obviously. And we could see, so there is an increase in costs, and not a decrease, but it's, uh, it's a lower uh, increase, which is, uh, as all of you already know, uh, something that is very hard to stop, the, the increase of costs. But then you need to be on a lower uh, level. So three lessons from, from Sweden, and I, I want to put it in a, a perspective. I strongly believe, and I created a think tank together with a lot of people, just to protect the idea of a universal healthcare model. I'm, I'm born and raised in a social democrat, not raised five years in Canada, five years in freedom, but born and raised in a social democratic controlled country. So the idea of a universal healthcare model is that is our constitution. We don't have a real constitution, but that is our constitution. You cannot challenge that in Sweden. But to protect that, you need incentive models derived from market economy. That is the only way to protect it, because you need to balance the universal healthcare model with entrepreneurship, cost effic effic efficiency, and choice to protect the leg legitimacy of, of the model. So competition in healthcare drives better work environment. You need alternative, and the unions sometimes argue for this, we need alternative employers to put pressure. Because in Sweden, in rural parts, there is no other healthcare provider to move to. So when they say, I don't like it here, what, are you going to take your family and move somewhere? Where? So there is the powers of the employer and the employee is needs to change to make the employer more attractive. There's the, we can use uh, competition in that. And uh, patient access really drives, together with activity-based uh, pricing models. And, um, but also cutting waiting times, we saw in, I don't know if it's the same in Canada, but in Sweden, it's, it's free for the healthcare provider, not the provider, the payer, to put people in waiting times. They don't cost you something. When you give them care, it costs you something. So what we saw, if I can give you a warning, if you would do this model, you would see a really high increase of costs initially, because there is a mountain of costs. And if you're waiting for, for a hip surgery and it costs $7,000 and 1,000 people are waiting, you can do the math. You're just pushing that cost further away. So you need to take into account that you need some kind of protection for that, uh, that spending initially. But then it comes down to normal levels when, when you uh, trigger that. Um, and one, uh, one um, I really, the activity-based pricing models really work when you have um, a, a fixed idea of what the, what the, if it's surgery and a lot, a lot of different uh, diagnosis where, where the doctor isn't uh, the, the, the sole source of what you should buy. However, in developing diagnosis like um, when uh, in Sweden, I guess it's the same here, where people, uh, the women especially, in working uh, between 30 and 50 years old with uh, children, going to the work environment and being, we call it burned out, like they, they, one day they just can't get up from bed. We don't know exactly what it is. It could be depression, it could be a lot of things. And we had that model as an activity-based pricing model, and that really showed how it doesn't work sometimes. So just putting up a warning for that as well, because you need to have 
some kind of oversight to make sure that the, the market powers are controlled and you need to, an active buyer. So if somebody here works in the, uh, in the, in the, on the payer side, you need to be very advanced of how you buy uh, healthcare and deal with that uh, as a, more as a business person rather than, uh, than a public servant, I would say. I would stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Gustav, for telling us a little bit about uh, the, the Swedish model and how it works and some lessons that we might have here in Canada. Our next guest, uh, as I mentioned, he comes from Australia, all the way from Melbourne. So his name is Terry Barnes. He's worked in federal and state government politics and administration for over 20 years. He was a senior ministerial policy advisor to two former federal health ministers, one of which uh, went on to become Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. So very much uh, excited to hear uh, what Terry has to say. Thank you. Terry. Well, it's good to get clapped before I start. <laughs> uh, good morning, and uh, thank you to Second Street and all the partners for uh, inviting me here to join you this morning. Uh, I'm going to try and keep to my 10 minutes as best I can. But, um, but certainly, I was, in, I was really interested to hear what uh, Jason and Steve had to say about the uh, the, the, the groundswell for change in Canada. It's something that hadn't really struck me in terms of what I'd been uh, reading up on in preparing for this. So, so maybe, maybe some of this may not fall on deaf ears, which is good. In 2013, uh, a report by the Paisley Institute here called for Canadian governments to look at how healthcare works in Australia <clears throat> and urge them to adopt Australia's acceptance of private healthcare provision in Canada. Technology is not my thing. Um, I actually endorsed the phrase thinking at the time in an op-ed for the National Post, uh, calling for, uh, I called Australia's uh, mixed public-private system Medicare Plus. Well, it was a foreigner, a foreigner making a, an op-ed and nothing changed. Neither did the Fraser Institute in report change anything. So little so that earlier this year, the Institute published another report which also highlighted how Australia outperforms Canada across the board in both health funding and outcomes. And again, urging your federal and provincial governments to look down under for health reform inspiration. So perhaps I should actually resubmit my opinion piece to the post. I mean, it's still current. But, uh, uh, I've got jet lag. But uh, look, in Australia, Medicare is a public health insurance scheme, and we call it Medicare too. Essentially, everyone is covered. Australian citizens and permanent residents pay 2% of their taxable income as a Medicare levy, with a 1% surcharge if you're on a higher income and don't have private health insurance. GP and specialist services can be bulk billed, which is direct to Medicare at no patient cost, and 80% of GP services are, or otherwise involve a co-payment above the Medicare rebate. Uh, an Australian dollars, 50 to 60 dollars for a standard GP visit is typical if it's not bulk billed. Public non-urgent acute procedures involve referral to a public specialist outpatient clinic and then to elective surgery waiting lists. Private health insurance covers admitted patient services on specialist referral, but gives patients their choice of doctor and hospital. Depending on provider contracts with insurers, patients would cover their policies excess. Uh, but, uh, and there may be some additional out-of-pocket contributions, but if you go private, there's little or no waiting time, or, uh, and, and certainly uh, and no waiting period for admission. You know, I mean, basically, if uh, your surgeon recommends you go in, you go in the next day. Urgent and complex surgical care mostly is done in tertiary public hospitals, but in capital cities, there are private hospitals equally capable of handling complex cases such as open-heart surgery. So, so generally, the, the public-private mix has been there for a long time. And, uh, and politically, uh, it's interesting because the conservative side of politics, my side of politics, uh, was out of office for a long time when Medicare got going under the um, Bob Hawke Labor government. And we realised that the only way we could actually win government ourselves was to commit to Medicare. And we did. 
but with uh, uh, innovations around private health insurance and supporting it. But the Labor Party, when it was out of office for 12 years after that, realised the only way it could get back into office was to actually support the private health system. So, so we actually had a political consensus that likes the public-private mix, even though people on both sides of the equation are not always happy with how it works. So now I've got this right. I got it right. There you go. Australia's healthcare system is far from perfect, especially in regional and Aboriginal Australia. But measured against comparable Canadian data, in which I was absolutely astounded to see some recently, we Australians should be really thankful. In most of Australia, you can see a GP within 24 hours. And the average elective surgery wait for a public patient is 49 days, seven weeks. And when I hear about uh, months and years waiting for surgery, I just, just I just, that beggars belief to me. So in terms of what Australia can offer you, I shall be as quick as I can. But, uh, but in this limited time, I, I would like to suggest a number of factors in which our healthcare framework does differ from yours, but could potentially, potentially be explored and even Canadianised to enhance the quality of access, performance outcomes and affordability. First, I think uh, we have a more practical concept of universality. I mean, the Canada Health Act presumes universality means a patient's primary and acute care must be free at point of access, end of story. And I see that Supreme Court decision uh, last year effectively reinforce that. In Australia, however, I think universality is interpreted differently. A patient must be free to choose to be a public patient in a public hospital or to be treated as bulk billed in primary care. But it's a flaw. It's not a ceiling, as I think it is in Canada. Thus, access to private health, private hospital episodic care and fee-for-service primary care with out-of-pockets above the Medicare rebate for the treatment item at the practice's discretion is not just allowable, it's a norm. Essentially, with our Medicare, Australia's federal government underwrites out-of-hospital medical services. It also funds private health insurance rebates and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which I'll talk about a bit later, as well as aged and disability care. The states are responsible for running and funding with a big, big federal contribution public hospitals. They forever argue, our governments, about the level of funding and federal contributions to the states. But each level of government knows where it stands with the, its responsibilities, and that, that makes the system more or less click along. Now, in terms of the private sector, private hospitals carry 42% of admitted patient episodes in Australia, 73% 73, 73% of which are day procedures. These are largely funded by private health insurance, which is in turn subsidised by the Australian government's generous premium rebates, which I should say, though, were not as generous as they were when the Howard government, of which I was a part, introduced them in, in the, the late 90s. Important too is pathology and diagnostic imaging infrastructure, which is almost entirely privately owned, but accessible at little or no patient cost through public hospitals and Medicare rebates. It's been estimated that each private health insurance premium subsidy dollar actually saves two federal or state healthcare spending dollars. So therefore makes government health spending go further it reduces pressure on public hospital capacity and infrastructure, which, unlike Canada, is almost entirely state government owned. And in terms of our insurers, I definitely am jet lagged, I'm sorry. Um, our, our health insurers are informed payers, uh, not US style HMOs. They cannot dictate clinical choices to providers, nor tell a patient who to see or which hospital to be seen in. That's not to say it's all sweetness and light, it's not. Uh, pay, payer provider tensions are endemic and very public, but especially at contracting time. We're having some big issues in Australia at the moment in terms of private hospitals complaining that health insurers are not coming to the party in terms of their costs, even if uh, they're running inefficient or um, commercially unviable businesses. So it's a, it's a big debate there at the moment. Um, but uh, when it comes to specialists in the public and private streams, uh, 
the split benefits surgeons and procedural specialists, but above all benefits patients. The way it works is that effectively proceduralists practice in the public system on a sessional rate basis. They're basically paid a fee for service. But their main income streams come from more lucrative private patient work. They can also gain rights of private practice in public hospitals in return for their public patient lists. That benefits both public and private patients and is crucial to addressing public patient waiting lists. It's a win-win. And actually, I think uh, it's, it's also a, sort of like a return of obligation to, to the public system in the, the, the fact that uh, well, most of our specialists, I assume it's the same here, are trained one way or another through it. Um, so, so in a sense, you're, you're trading off what you've been given uh, for the for the Lamborghinis and the the private health, private school fees that you're able to afford uh, when you're a, a fully fledged uh, surgeon or specialist. Activity-based pricing is an important issue as well here. There's no question that the embrace of ABP now with a national efficient pricing and data collection network. It's transformed Australian public and private hospital operations. It started in my own state of Victoria 30 years ago, but it has spread so completely that few remember the bad old days of total block funding and entrenched inefficiencies. ABP isn't perfect, and it's not a panacea, it's not a magic bullet. And, and what's defined as in or out of a classified episode of care can often be hot, hotly debated. However, the national independent pricing and reporting mechanism that we now have in Australia has taken a lot of the heat from that. ABP encourages efficiency as well as increasing throughput and minimising both waiting times and inpatient stays and focuses the minds of hospital administrators as well as clinicians. As I said, it's not a panacea, but it is effective. But, but one thing I, I would like to comment on is, is our pharmaceutical benefits scheme, because I think it is a crucial factor in the Australian healthcare equation that you just don't have here. To an Australian, it beggars belief that Canada doesn't have a comprehensive national pharmacare pr program like our PBS. And that includes the piecemeal pharmacare coverage that's currently before your federal parliament. Uh, I, yeah, I, I just can't see that a country like Canada with your, with your population, with your federal system, uh, has got such piecemeal and, and, and such a pro, uh, parochial approaches to, to ph pharmacy and pharmacare. Access to our PBS medicines is on a national, not state basis. Medicines are listed on the PBS only if proven cost as well as clinically effective. And the maximum patients pay per script actually at the moment is Australian uh, $31, regardless of the price of the medicine. And that can include uh, orphan drugs at very high cost. The PBS succeeds because the Australian government uses its immense pur purchasing power in the system, its monopsony, to drive hard pricing bargains with drug companies. And those companies need the PBS uh, to, to get a strong return from their products and their patents. Governments are happy, patients are happy. Pharma companies aren't always happy. So you know, in many ways, that's a good policy and political outcome. But like any healthcare system, any national system, there is clearly room for improvement in Canada's. There's also improvement, room for improvement in ours. I mean, the late Emmett Hall of Hall Commission fame would disagree. But you can consider a number of the Australian ways of doing things, the Australian measures uh, uh, in relation particularly to public-private, uh, without, in my view, breaching the Canada Health Act principles, even though it, that may mean reinterpreting them. Look, it's presumptuous for foreigners like me to tell you how to reform your healthcare framework. People like me can only illustrate and suggest, but I will say that when it comes to enlightened, private inclusive healthcare and what it can do for Canada, don't look south. Instead, look east to Europe or southwest to my beautiful, wonderful country, Australia. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thank, thank you both for, can you guys hear me? Try, try this one. Testing. 
Hello? Hopefully this one's still working. There we go. Um, thank you both for uh, giving us a quick one-on-one -on, -one on your respective healthcare systems. Just a reminder, if you do have any questions, just write them down on the green sheets and Harrison will come along and, and pick them up. Um, you both talked about activity-based funding, and just in case anyone in the room isn't familiar with that concept, what often happens in Canada is governments will cut hospitals a big check each year, and they basically say, good luck, we hope you can help a lot of patients. Activity-based funding is the opposite, where they will fund hospitals uh, based on what they actually achieve, how many patients they're helping. Every time they get a complete a knee operation, they get another check, they get more money. So it incentivizes output. And you, you, you both talked about the importance of using that tool um, to incentivize output in your respective countries. Are, are there any stories or anecdotes or important lessons that you can think of that um, you know, have occurred in your respective countries by using that particular uh, funding approach? And I'm, I'm hoping your microphone's working there. Can you hear me okay? Maybe, this, oh, so I'll, I'll start. <laughs> uh, now I would say that I would, uh, a lot of the um, waiting time, cutting waiting time in, in, in Sweden has been directly um, linked to moving from this pricing model where here's a lot of money, I hope you do your best, uh, to a more follow-up activity-based funding. I'd say that is uh, critical for, for that kind of uh, um, increase in output where we have, uh, and it works in, but it's different to talk. It's it's different to talk about it in in a hospital or in a uh, in a in an emergency room because nobody there works for profit. Nobody works there on a market term. They just work there because they want to do the best for the patients. So it's it's very um, important when you talk about it and how you describe it. It is not to make sure that uh, you don't spend money on patients. It's to make sure that the enough of money is, is um, uh, just enough money is spent on this patient so we have more money for the next patient. It's like how to describe it from a solidarity point of view is very important to have a success in the public debate about activity-based funding because it's, and, and the risk of it is that you measure a lot. If you want to pay for specific things, then you have to measure, are you doing these specific things? And that can drive costs as well. So you need to be quite careful with that. But it still outweighs the, the, the positive, the positive outweighs. Good, I, can you hear me okay? Um, you're cutting in Australia. Uh, activity grows pricing, as I said, it's trying to the same. But I think my side of Victoria is a good classic example because I, I think uh, in the mid 90s when it was introduced, uh, Victoria went from I think having the most inefficient public hospital system in the country within a couple of years having the most efficient uh, in terms of throughput, in terms of uh, cost per patient or cost per episode, in terms of length of stay. Uh, without compromising the quality of care. And, and uh, I think basically it spread from there to the other states and, and ultimate, and also of course to the private system. I think the problem with the risk of the activity-based pricing in the public system in Australia though is if it's done in a lean and mean way and done the proper way, uh, that, that can lead to hospitals feeling the pinch if they're not operating efficiently enough. Uh, so in, in Victoria, at the end of this current previous financial year, day in, day out, <laughs> the close of fiscal year, I think uh, uh, the number of the, the major public hospitals in Melbourne have knocked on the door of the, the health and says, oh, we need $450 million to actually make sure that we break even. And of course, the, the governments have been very politically sensitive, uh, basically gave them money. So, so if you're going to use activity-based pricing, you actually have to maintain the political discipline to keep it going. That's really interesting. Um, one of the big elephants in the room here in Canada when it comes to healthcare is this uh, sort of North Korean, Cuban style approach we have to choice or the lack of. Um, you know, you can get your dog hip operation tomorrow, but if you want a hip operation in much of the country, you have two choices. You either wait for the government to get around to provide it, which sometimes can be measured in years, 
or you have to leave your province and go somewhere else. I, I'm generalizing a bit, but we have these bans in place. The rest of the world does not. When, when people talk about having choice between using the public system or finally allowing private options, inevitably someone puts their hand up or they speak out and they say, well, if we do this, then these private clinics are going to steal all the staff from the public system. How big of a problem is that in your respective countries? And are there ways that you mitigate that potential issue? Well, as I said in my, my talk, there's not a problem in Australia because of the way that uh, private specialists and surgeons are encouraged to work in the public system and effectively do it, well, not as an act of charity, but, but certainly uh, in return for what the system is given it. Uh, but they also get to what, uh, what are called rights of private practice in public hospitals. They can bring their private patients in uh, to do alongside their public lists. So it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, so, so in that sense, there's no poaching, it's more sharing. Unfortunately, it's not the same experience in Sweden. Initially, there was um, there was a strong push for choice, and uh, and when the private healthcare providers started up, they recruited a lot from the public sector. Mm -hmm. uh, but we managed the discussion and the anticipation of what was going to happen by saying, it is not your doctor, or it's not their doctor. Every, we, the taxpayer, are the ones who are paying. They are our doctors. It doesn't matter where they work. Mm -hmm. They are our doctors. So when there are layoffs in the private sector in Sweden, in healthcare, the politicians are asked, what are you doing? Not the CEO. Mm. So it's a perspective of if it's paid by taxes, then it's, it's not maybe owned by everything, but, oh, but the results are owned, owned by everybody, but uh, it's done, I, I, do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more of a perspective whose the staff is. Right, and w what would be the reaction though if someone, let's say your respective governments announced tomorrow that in a year's time, Patients will know you're moving to the Canadian model and, and you're no longer going to have that choice. So your, your single option is you have to wait for the state or leave your province, leave your country for care. What would be the, the public's reaction to that? I can start. In, in uh, some parts of Sweden, they would not really care because it's in the rural parts. They're not so much of a choice. Uh, a practical choice, there is a theoretical one, so they will probably say what, what's going to change. Mm -hmm. But in the big cities where there's a lot of competition, uh, people would be outraged and there has been some cities where the political majority has shifted to the left and where they had say they were trying to pull back on, on choice and they started with a gynecologist and the, like the feminist movement, like why can't I choose my own Gynecologists, mm. what are you trying to do? What is this? So and the, so the left feminist broke the left story of, of choice. So some things are fundamental, mm. and it's, it would be hard to roll back. But of course, it's. Uh, but what happened is that uh, people would feel less uh, powerful. The pe employees would feel less powerful because they can't choose uh, alternative employer, and the cost would go through the roof, and taxation would increase even more. Mm. Look, I think in Australia, uh, if that happened, it would be the end of civilization as we know it. Um, as I said before, there is a political consensus that uh, balances the public and the private sectors in the way they work and operate together. Um, in a way that makes the whole system relatively efficient. Uh, but people want their private choice, people want their private health insurance, but also want access to, to uh, publicly funded health care. Uh, and so, so to, to basically cut off the private arm altogether, it's just not thinkable. Just not thinkable. But, you know, I just beg us believe that uh, we could even consider it. What, we've been talking about private options and the role that private healthcare can play within a public system and then also having choice outside of the public system. Um, is there any research or do you have any thoughts about the benefit to workers in having choice? So, so often in Canada, when you graduate and you're working as a nurse or a doctor, you don't have a lot of choices in terms of where you can work. It's, do I want to work for this government hospital or this government hospital? And it's the same kind of unionized environment with certain restrictions and so forth. Some people like it, some people don't. 
they pack and they pack up and they leave. But it, it, are there benefits to the workers for having alternative arrangements for uh, workplaces? Uh, our think tank actually put out a report about this for a year ago. And what we saw was that the public sector had higher wages for nurses mm -hmm. because they had to pay them more because they're treating them worse. Mm. So what we saw was that uh, students, uh, uh, students who are supposed to be nurses, or were going to be nurses, when they said, who is your ideal employer, they all said the public sector. But after working five years, they almost all said the private sector. <laughs> so th there is an idea of a higher value working for the public sector, but then coming there, being one of those, I don't know if it's Gen Z or what, <laughs> what level they are, but coming there and like realizing, my friends who work at McKinsey or uh, other kind of places, they can work two, hour, two days from home, they can earn this, and their boss really knows what their name are and wishes them a good weekend, and I'm in the public sector, they don't know who I am, they can replace me anytime. So there is a lack, lack of satisfaction, and they have to pump up the wages to make sure that they stay. And that is, um, uh, it's really clear. Uh, and unfortunately, they can't learn from each other. You would think that the public sector HR would go to the private sector HR and say, hey, what are you doing? Can I learn from you? But instead, they want to stop them, stop the competition. Look, I, think, uh, I think in Australia, uh, in terms of doctors, that, that I think uh, private practice is the way to go. And that's where most want to be. Uh, though, though some love working in hospitals, whether they're public or private. Nursing, it's, it's a little different, it's highly unionised, uh, but um, it's also very wage competitive. Uh, so you've got to, what, six, uh, six states, two territories, and the private system. And um, what we're finding is that uh, uh, in terms of competition for nurses, and they are a very scarce commodity, uh, that uh, yeah, wage deals are, are, are very, very competitive. I mean, my state of Victoria is just uh, up to uh, in, a, in a very good bargain deal, but uh, uh, nurses' wages by 25%. You know, other states going to have to follow suit, the private sector is going to have to follow suit. Um, so to keep particularly good people and, and, and attract others. And, and I think that's the, that's the problem. That's a, a really, uh, uh, in terms of the economics of a, a rigid workforce and nursing is, uh, that uh, ensuring that we get nurses distributed and, and, and the, the quality of their work, which is great, distributed fairly, is a good challenge. We, we've got an interesting question here. It, it comes up from time to time, and that is that when you have uh, governments partnering with private providers to deliver health care, there's this claim that the, the private providers will just go after the easy cases, the ones that don't cost very much, and then the public system's going to have to handle all the cases that, that cost a lot of money. Um, does, uh, I'll put the question to both of you, does that happen? Is it a problem? Are there ways to mitigate it? What, what are your thoughts on that? To, to an extent, it does happen in Australia. Um, that, uh, as I think I said in the talk, the uh, uh, public system tends to do the more complex stuff on the whole, but in private hospitals, private, you know, obviously people in private practice are doing private work at complex levels, in, in, uh, particularly in capital cities. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but generally, look, I think, uh, um, I've also tried to think, I'm sorry about that. I can pick up because it was um, the cherry picking argument yes, that you yeah. put, you you pick the easy ones um, with most revenue, and then that it's um, we have had a lot of cases of that, and it's forbidden. And one one lesson is that to compete to. Um, to make sure that the system is still uh, legitimate, you need to throw the, out the bad apples. Mm -hmm. So you get one warning. You get, the second warning is that you're out. Mm -hmm. And then you need to be out for a couple of years before you let him back in. And probably you, you need one warning, but then you need uh, you can't have like three warnings because the population, the, you don't, the, the bad apples, they, they destroy the whole uh, harvest. What, I don't know if you can say that. <laughs> but uh, so you make sure that you really need to sort out the bad ones uh, early on. Cherry picking, that was the most trying to think of. Um, 
logic in, in our system, the bulk of hip size and these are actually done in the private hospital system. Yeah. Um, there's no complaint about that. I mean, basically, that's uh, taking pressure to do that elective work off the public system. Uh, that's, that's an essential integral part of the way it works. I, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, we have a big problem in, in Canada, the US, the Western world, and many parts of it with the, the healthcare system spending a lot of time and energy treating health problems that are entirely preventable. Um, things that come from people not exercising enough, poor diets, um, you know, other activities that people engage in. Are there any effective policies in either of your countries that uh, nudge people carefully towards maybe healthier living to take some of the strain off the system so these, there's fewer people developing these, these diseases and other health problems in, in the first place? We have, um, uh, we call it a physical um, exercise on prescription where the doctors would say that you're overweight, you're, you're unhealthy, risk for life, and you need to exercise. So instead of putting you on pharmaceuticals, I put you on a treadmill. And this is the, this is the membership fee, like the, the tax, <laughs> well, that was, uh, like, so the tax pay for the membership fee, like, you can choose not whatever place you want, but some kind of cap of, of what it could cost, and they can go and train there, because we see that there is a, is a higher, you're more, you're more inclined to do it if a doctor tells you to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't change the system. I think like the pharmaceuticals will do a lot more to health than this, this uh, activity, but this costs a, a lot less. So yeah, I think you need to do a lot. And then for the last remark on that, on that issue, I don't think that po public policy would probably not solve the problem with obesity. Mm -hmm. It needs to be something cultural, socially, that is a lot stronger than political reform. Okay. But yeah. Uh, I think we spent a lot of money on uh, the campaign so far, not that they do much at all. Uh, but I think, uh, and we did try what we call lifestyle prescriptions about 20 years ago. I've seen this sort of thing to uh, start talking about. But uh, they never, never really caught on. But uh, again, health, health professionals, particularly GPs, uh, uh, other advisors, there's this strong influential with, with patients and, and, and uh, if they give you a hint that you have to lose a bit of weight, you have to get a bit more exercise, you have to uh, change your diet. Um, people do this, uh, but, uh, but I think uh, a lot of faith is put in terms of you know, nanny state measures and, and certainly big high spending media campaigns that just don't actually change anything. Okay, I heard someone clapping about uh, the, the treadmill line earlier. I'm not sure who it was, but we're going to take a treadmill break in a few minutes. Um, or if you want to run around outside, you're certainly free to do that too. Um, I'm curious about how much learning occurs when you have a more vibrant healthcare sector, when there's more of a role for the private sector and it's working alongside the public sector and you've got people maybe working in both at the same time or maybe they spend some time on one side, then they go to the other. How much learning is there between the two so that these lessons are, are transported maybe particularly into the public system from private providers which sometimes can be more effective? I think that actually happens a lot. Uh, and I think it's happened for quite a long time now. Uh, and particularly I think uh, public system learning from the private system. Uh, particularly in terms of being leaner. I won't say leaner, but certainly leaner and more efficient. Uh, being open to innovation uh, open for technological change. I mean, certainly in terms of uh, the use of telehealth, that's, that's exploded in Australia since COVID. Um, I think I think those types of uh, that interact. But on the other hand, I think the private sector is learning from the public as well. Uh, and I think the fact that, as I said, that uh, many, uh, particularly specialists, uh, work in both systems uh, means that lessons go both ways. Unfortunately, not enough. <laughs> we, uh, there is, uh, um, institutionally, it is, uh, knowledge is traded through competition. My competitor is doing this, 
I want to do the same. I'll just copy him or her. That is some kind of institutional learning that I would say is the most effective one, but uh, on a large scale. But then I think it's mo mostly by chance, by right person getting a new job in, in trading sectors and just bringing knowledge with them. But unfortunately, not enough. There's too much prestige. Okay. Uh, we have a question here about uh, the, the differentiation of responsibilities between federal and provincial. And so one of the problems we face in Canada, and, and perhaps Premier Campbell will touch on this later, but when provincial governments sometimes try to experiment or do something different, Ottawa comes in and says, aha, we don't like that, we're going to cut your funding. Uh, so there can be these, these penalties in place. We've got a bit of a tug of war w between provincial governments, which are responsible for delivering health care, and Ottawa, which funds just enough that they can kind of deter certain types of experimentation and things become very political. Uh, do you have that particular problem in your respective countries? Um, look, as I said before, I think uh, responsibility for everyone is a, excuse me, a clear cut. Um, and the events, uh, well, I'll go back to the events. You said I worked with Tony Abbott, the ex health minister, and he had this grand idea, grand idea that uh, federal government should take over public hospitals in you know, the states. So, you know, he called it a dog's breakfast of divided responsibilities, um, which are two of the next 10 years. Uh, but um, John Howard, the prime minister, a great man, uh, also was politically realist and realised that. Uh, the federal government importing all the problems of public hospitals and their management and their funding uh, would be a political disaster. Uh, so, so he said, Tony, no, come down, come down. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but effectively, what I, I guess I'm saying is that politically, as well as in policy sense, the federal and state governments stay in their own lanes. Mm. They cooperate, they talk, they gripe grab about funding levels, but, but they know what they're responsible for and how they do it and how they deliver it. In Sweden, it's more of a party situation. If you're, if the left are controlling federal level, they're blaming the conservative provincial level, and then the opposite. Right. So it's not really. There's no strategy to it. It's just politics. So, so they're staying in their own lanes, I guess, in both countries. We could do with a bit more of that in Canada. Um, there's a, a question here: How influential and problematic are unions in your healthcare systems? Is that an issue? Oh, look, I think, as I said, uh, at the nursing level, it's, it's very much a, a problem. It's basically encouraged in the hospital sector, public and private, I think, rigidities that don't need to be there. And, uh, and the big, big issue is, is nurse to bed ratios, um, in terms of the unions insisting on a certain number of nurses always being maintained in relation to, to public hospital beds. And, uh, and that's basically embedded in the system in such a way. But the, those ratios were based on the way that care was delivered 40 years ago, not the way it's delivered now. So effectively, it's better bedding in deficiency. Uh, and it's very hard for hospital administrators and, and politicians and ministry budgets to actually get around that. In Sweden, the, the, the nurse union made a big mistake pushing for increased, um, what do you call it, that the first salary you get when you're finished like the, you know, understand what I mean? And so what happened was they pushed it so hard, so people training the new nurses were earning less than a new nurse. So the experienced nurse, which is premium <laughs> in healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, she, she or he didn't want to work there anymore because they're not appreciating me as they should. So they, uh, being in a high taxed society, they created their own company, renting themselves back to the same employer. So we have a, depending on if you're leaning left or right, we have a big problem or a possibility of very many nurses renting themselves out because they want to be in power of their own situation. And they, when they're powerless in a public-driven healthcare, they will opt out. Hmm. It's, not up, it's not up that way or that way, it's up or out. So you need to take care of them and listen to them. And the unions sometimes, yeah, they have their own agenda. Hmm. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have a, a statistician among us today that is very uh, excited about some of the stats that you guys have shared, particularly um, 
the surgical wait times in Australia and how quickly you can get in. I'll just ask, are, are there any, you've learned a little bit more about Canada's system over the past little while as you prepared for this and some of the stats you heard today, but are there any numbers that really shock you about the, the gap between maybe what wait times are in, in your respective countries versus here? Oh, when I hear about specialist weights in the EU or more, I just can't believe that. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, people, I, I was waiting for a specialist group consultation in more than a month or two. Uh, that would be unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, by waiting for a GP consultation more than, more than three or four days, mm -hmm. that would be yeah. unacceptable. Uh, to, to what it seems to be normal in the way that uh, well, Canada works is yeah, it's just, I just beg, yeah, as I said, uh, just looking at the numbers, it just absolutely staggered me. I, mean, it was a, I, I actually think that Australia is not, by far, is not the most efficient universal system in the world, not by any means. I think it's, it's got its, it's you know, I, I, I guess I glossed over it because of the time we had, but, but, but we're, not, we're not perfect in terms of uh, all, you know, dysfunctionality, in terms of uh, uh, best interests and stakeholders uh, dominating agendas and so forth, but Canada just seems so sclerotic and so so absolutely rigid that uh, things won't change. But on the other hand, listening to the earlier presentations, there's clearly a public will for things to change if uh, decision makers and politicians actually prepared to write the board. So Australia's not going to copy the Canada model then, is what you're saying? <laughs> No, we actually like to spend uh, our, some of our GDP on other things, so, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to what we have. I mean, the thing, the lesson for me in comparing with this is that what we think is clunky and inefficient is actually not too bad. I would like to to stress the fact that change can happen quickly in healthcare if provided the, the, the correct structure of entrepreneurship and competitiveness, you can achieve a lot, which is not possible in other political areas as infrastructure, housing. There are super rigid systems. Even if you're a political entrepreneur, things take a lot of time, but in healthcare, it moves a lot faster if you let it. And that could be, if there's any politicians in the room, I would say that is a possibility to stand out in the crowd, to be able to, during a man, I don't know what to call it, like a period of power, like between elections, be able to show actual results, not just only promises. So that, and we had, um, we had a two year waiting time for, I don't know the English word for it, but uh, teaching children to read, like they have uh, the, the letters mix up. Like uh, dyslexia, oh, dyslexia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we had a waiting time for two years and for a child in school, two years, that's make it or break it. And after one year, after making activity based choice, uh, competitiveness, we had two weeks waiting time. Mm. There are people, uh, doctors and nurses who want to work Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays if they're paid for it. Mm -hmm. It works. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> What, how important are user fees in this system? If I understand the Australian model correctly, that if, if you need to go and see your family doctor, you may find one that doesn't charge or other ones where they will charge. And in Sweden, I think you do pay a small user fee. Is that correct? How important is it to have user fees in the system? And are they ever at a rate where they're just uh, not attainable for, say, lower income people to be able to access health care? Somebody who uh, once advocated a seven dollar mandatory co payment for going to the doctor, we almost brought a company down for doing so. But, uh, um, but I think that uh, uh, a reasonable price signal to patients in terms of their health care is not a bad thing. Uh, most, most Australians think the average number of visits per person to a GP is about five a year. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a small co contribution is, is quite appropriate. Uh, I even think you know, we're talking about $50, $60 uh, for, for, uh, for a copay. I, I think that's quite reasonable if you don't see the doctor. But I think part of the problem is that if it's absolutely free and guaranteed to be free, uh, people's expectations uh, are, are skewed by that. So that uh, you may feel that uh, you should go to the, to the family doctor for a simple when you, you could actually stay home and uh, make sure you 
have a bed rest and pop and drink or whatever. Um, but, uh, but certainly I think uh, uh, people, people understand in the way that we do things that uh, even free things come at a cost. And, uh, and that's, I think there's also a feeling that you can have universality in terms of guarantee law of uh, um, free access that those who can afford to make a contribution should do so. I think that there's a, been a, well, uh, opposition to that, and particularly the political debate I was involved in uh, 10 years ago, uh, sort of revolved around that and the, what universality is. But, but I think increasingly over time, people realise that if you want to keep the quality uh, primary care system that we have in Australia, and we do, uh, that you need to be prepared to invest in it. And that includes investing out of your dollars as well as out of taxpayer dollars. And I, I just want to clarify, is there a safeguard then for, say, lower income people or maybe someone who's fallen on hard times so that uh, it's still accessible for them? Yes, yeah, there's a, there's, there is a safety net system. Uh, and, and, and when it comes to bulk billing in terms of you know, free, free point of access, uh, doctors you know, medical practices uh, use discretion as well. So if uh, they know that uh, somebody's a, a pensioner or a, uh, on a on concession of health card, uh, that uh, they're prepared to well, build in. But if it's somebody like me who comes in and is uh, dressed like this and relatively healthy, uh, that they can uh, afford to, to, to build in. Okay. We have user fees, but they are to deter from overusage. Um, and I think in any universal healthcare, uh, like a, from us, like a, that is the the main risk is that when it's free, it's overused, and the people who really need it get back. They get they they are. Um, <laughs> Put last in the, in the waiting time. So I think user fees are essential to a universal healthcare model and cancellation freeze fees. Do you have that here? Like if you would book a time with a doctor and you wouldn't show up, are you, do you need, so it's laughing. Uh, because I think that is very important. That's an important lesson for Sweden because we didn't have, we, you weren't, like if you would miss a hotel booking, then of course you have to pay the hotel fee because if you cancel in the last minute, but if you cancel on a, on a doctor last minute, you only pay what, like 20, 20 Canadian dollars. Mm -hmm. And we said that that's not right. The, the actual fee is maybe 250. So let's, let's uh, share it. Mm -hmm. So, and that was a good debate to shake up the idea of what is free and it's free to, to somebody else. Somebody else needs that time. Yeah. So I think that's to shape that narrative uh, is very important. Okay. Well, listen, thank you so much for giving us a bit of insight on your respective healthcare models. This has been really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.